Hey there folks, Kamal here and today we're going to talk about a very important theorem in complex analysis called Gauss's mean value theorem, which as the name implies deals with the mean or average value of functions. But how on earth is the average value of a function defined in the complex realm? Well, we need to consider a function f of z that is continuous on some domain d. And within this domain, we need to consider a disk of positive radius. So we're talking about the set of z such that absolute value z minus z naught is less than or equal to rho being a positive real number. This disk is contained within our domain d and will define the average value of the function f of z on the circle centered at z naught of radius r as 1 over 2 pi times the integral over the circle centered at z naught radius r of f of z plus r times e to the i theta d theta. And one thing to notice here is because of the continuity of the function f of z as r approaches 0, the average value of the function will of course approach the average value of f at, will approach the value of f that is at the center of the circle. Okay, cool. Now what exactly is the theorem? Well, the theorem needs a function u of z that is harmonic on some domain d. And again, we need to consider a disk that is absolute value z minus z naught less than or equal to rho contained within d. Then in this case, the average value of the function that is the integral over the circle centered at z naught of radius r, of course, being less than rho, 1 over 2 pi outside, of u of z plus r times e to the i theta d theta, this thing equals the value of the function at the center. So that's a pretty neat theorem, but what about the proof? The proof is actually quite simple. Because the function u is harmonic, we know a certain differential is closed. That is negative partial u by partial y dx plus partial u by partial x dy. This thing here is closed, meaning that the integral over any closed contour, in this case the circle centered at z naught of radius r, of negative partial u by partial y dx plus partial u by partial x dy equals zero. And that is quite nice, but what's even nicer is the fact that we're integrating on a circular path, which means a very nice parameterization is available to us. We have x here equal to x naught plus r times cosine theta, and y equal to y naught plus r times sine theta, where x naught is the real part of z naught and y naught is the imaginary part of z naught. Okay, cool. So differentiating gives us dx equal to r times negative sine theta d theta, and dy equals r times cosine theta d theta. And we can use these results in our equation up here that I'm going to call equation 1. So we have 0 equal to the integral, and the integral transforms into an integral from 0 to 2 pi of partial u by partial y times sine theta, where the negative signs cancelled out, plus partial u by partial x cosine theta, and r here is a constant that we can factor out, and we're integrating with respect to theta now. Okay, cool, that seemed kind of useful, but there's another way to read these equations. We have cosine theta, this thing would equal partial x by partial r. And sine theta over here should be partial y by partial r. So making use of these relations, we have 0 equal to r times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of partial u by partial y, partial y by partial r, plus partial u by partial x, partial x by partial r, d theta. And this is all quite nice because it's just an application of the chain rule. We have the partial derivative of u with respect to r. And let's not, let's not forget what u is a function of in this context. We have partial derivative with respect to r of u on the circle. So u here is a function of z naught plus r times e to the i theta. So we have finally 0 equal to r times the integral from 0 to 2 pi. And r is of course non-zero, so we can expand using 1 by r. So we have integral 0 to 2 pi partial u by partial r d theta. 
And now we can switch up the order of the integration and differentiation operators to get the partial derivative with respect to r of the integral from 0 to 2 pi of u, which again, remember, is a function of z naught plus r times e to the i theta. This thing equals 0. And wait a minute, we could expand using 1 over 2 pi as well. But this equation means that the partial derivative with respect to r of the average value of the function u equals 0, which implies that the average value of u here is a constant, which is quite nice. But now how do we prove that its value is in fact the value at the center? That is again a very simple question because we know in the limit as r approaches infinity, the average value of u on the circle centered at z naught of radius r equals its value at the center. And because the average value is a constant, this implies that 1 over 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 2 pi of u of z naught plus r times e to the i theta d theta, in other words, the average value on a circle centered at z naught always equals the value of the function at the center itself. You can even extend the notion of average value to get another version of this theorem that I came across as an exercise while teaching one of my students. In this version, we have f of z being analytic on some domain d, and we know that analytic functions are indeed harmonic. And in this case, we take the average value over the entire disk centered at z naught of radius r, and again, we need it equal to the value of the function at the center of the disk. The proof here is quite simple. We have some nice integrals to deal with. So we'll call the average value here a of r for reference purposes. So a of r equals 1 by pi r squared times the double integral over the disk centered at z naught of f of x plus i times y dx dy. Now it seems wise here to transition to polar coordinates. So we have dx dy transforming to rho d rho d theta, where rho varies from 0 to r and theta varies from 0 to 2 pi. So a of r equals 1 by pi r squared times the integral from 0 to 2 pi, integral 0 to r, f of z naught plus rho times e to the i theta, rho d rho d theta. We now switch up the order of the integration operators to get 1 over pi r squared, integral 0 to r, integral 0 to 2 pi, f of z naught plus rho e to the i theta, rho d theta d rho, and the rho variable is independent of the theta variable, so we can take it outside the integration with respect to theta operator. And now, notice that the integral you have with respect to theta is exactly the average value of the function times 2 pi. And we know from the above theorem that this thing equals 2 pi f of z naught. Okay, cool. So this implies that a of r equals 1 by pi r squared times the integral from 0 to r of rho 2 pi f of z naught d rho. And 2 pi f of z naught is just a constant, so we'll take it outside the integration operator. We have 1 by pi r squared, 2 pi f of z naught, some nice cancellation taking place, and we're integrating from 0 to r rho d rho, which of course yields rho squared by 2, with the limits being 0 and r, which implies that the average value equals exactly the value at the center, which is f of z naught after the nice cancellations, which proves this version of the theorem. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something from the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.